Hey everyone, Cherie here. Did you know that ballet was established approximately 200 years before point shoes were even developed? Let's get into the why behind point shoes and discover how and why ballerinas first rose to the tips of their toes. Point shoes are synonymous with ballet and ballerinas around the world. And although it's easy to take for granted that they've existed as a long-standing element in ballet history, the truth is that point shoes have an interesting evolution and history all their own. Though we won't delve too much into the history of ballet in this segment, it is important to set the scene. It wasn't until the reign of Louis XIV of France that ballet really began to take shape. The art form was officially codified and given vocabulary and terminology that is still used around the world today. The two things to have really changed since Louis XIV are dancers' technique and dress, an evolution that goes hand in hand. Ballet as we know it developed from its first iteration of court dance, becoming more fluid and elegant throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, with ballet shoes transforming with it. It wasn't until about 1681 that women began to dance ballet, and at that time, the standard ballet shoe had heels. Taking it back to its origins as a court dance, dancers wore layers of intricate costuming along with large headdresses and formal dress shoes with small heels. The clothing was quite restrictive and only allowed dancers a small range of movement, such as small hops, promenades, slight turns, and of course, many curtsies. However, ballet transitioned from being primarily a men's dance to having many female dancers and they wanted to do more. That meant removing the heels from the shoes. It's said that in the late 17th, early 18th century, Marie-Anne de Coupes de Camargo, a Belgian-French dancer of the Paris Opera Ballet, became the first to wear a nun-heeled shoe, enabling her to perform leaps that would have been difficult, if not impossible, in the more conventional shoes of the age. The new flat-bottom slippers spread quickly throughout the ballet community as dancers were liberated by the abandonment of the heel. The new slippers worn during the 18th century are much like the shoes worn by young ballerinas in classes today. They were secured to the feet with ribbons around the ankle and were pleated underneath the toes for a better fit. The new slippers allowed for a full extension and enabled the dancer to use the whole foot. This new shoe gave dancers the ability to do more jumps and leaps, something that used to be impossible, but it didn't stop with the slipper. It is rumored that the first dancers to actually rise up on their toes did so with the help of the flying machine, a 1795 invention by Charles Didlot, a French dancer and choreographer, using a rope and pulley system that lifted dancers upward, allowing them to stand on their toes. The machine gave dancers an ethereal look that became very popular among audiences and choreographers, leaving them seeking more. As dance progressed into the 19th century, the emphasis on technical skill increased, as did the desire to dance on point without the aid of wires. Then came Marie Taglioni. In 1832, she popularized point work in her father's ballet, La Sylphide, at the Paris Opera Ballet, which became a turning point in ballet's history. Not only did this mark women wearing shorter dresses, also known as the romantic tutu, in order to show off more intricate footwork, but Marie became the first ballerina to dance on point. Now, some clarification is needed. The point shoes Taglioni used were vastly different to the shoes dancers wear today, as was her technical skill on point. She had simply taken satin slippers and darned them on the sides and at the toes to help them keep their shape. Since these slippers still offered no support, she padded her toes to protect them and only was able to do short and light movements. Ultimately, dancers had to rely on the strength of their own toes, feet, ankles, and legs for support. Moving into the 19th century, dancers like Pierina Legnani, credited as the first person to do 32 fuetes, wore shoes with a sturdy, flat platform at the front end of the shoe, rather than the more sharply pointed toe of earlier models. These shoes also included a box made of layers of fabric for containing the toes and a stiffer, stronger sole. They were constructed without nails and the soles were only stiffened at the toes, making them nearly silent. 
by the 1880s, shoemaker Salvatore Capizio was working on improving the construction of point shoes after a series of working on them as he served as the official shoemaker for performing artists with the Met. He made so many repairs for the point shoes that he decided to improve upon it and create his own version. It wasn't until the 20th century that we really see the creation of the modern point shoe. By this time, ballet was a more widespread art form and Russia had become the leading creative epicenter. With new ballets becoming more and more demanding of dancers and their technique, one of Russia's prima ballerinas, Anna Pavlova, decided to change her shoes. Pavlova's feet had high arches and were very tapered, which meant when she was on point, all of her weight was on her big toes and that became rather painful. To fix this issue, Pavlova put tough leather soles into her shoes for extra support and then hardened and flattened the toe area to form a box. At first, Pavlova was criticized for changing her shoes as many considered it cheating. But over time, her solution became the framework for how point shoes are made today. It is interesting to note that Pavlova purchased Capizio shoes for herself and her entire company during her first tour of the United States. And because of her generous praise of Salvatore's work, it ensured Capizio's success. In order to properly thank her, Salvatore designed a special point shoe and named it the Pavlova. Looking into the 1990s and onto the present, Manufacturers of point shoes began using synthetic materials like plastic to make the toe cup and other hidden supports. Still, the basic structure of point shoes has changed very little in the last 100 years. Today, most point shoes are still traditionally made and all done by hand. The box is made of tightly packed layers of fabric, cardboard, and paper hardened by glue. The shank is a rigid material that provides support for the arch of the foot when on point and can vary in stiffness and length depending on the needs of a dancer. For final touches, the shoes are wrapped in satin with a leather outer sole. As time goes on, point shoes will keep evolving from utilizing flexible plastics to helping extend the life of shoes to other technologies, the point shoemakers will keep changing shoes to support the needs of dancers and the art form. This timeline touches on breakthroughs in the development of point shoes. The desire to dance on point created the need for point shoes and the development of point shoes made dancing on point easier. The technique and shoe developed together. Now, you know.